It's not like going to Nebraska. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our March RV Repair Club live question and answer. My name is Dave Solberg, the managing editor, and uh, I have kind of an interesting week this week. I was looking through some old slides. Um, every year, my folks would rent an RV a couple times a year, and we'd go to once to Colorado every year to see my aunt and uncle, and then one big trip somewhere. And I was uh, looking through a few of the slides that uh, my folks had saved up trying to find our picture of the moon landing and all these slides of our Yellowstone adventure and our trip to Washington, D.C., and the and uh, the one of the Yellowstone, I specifically remember my dad got out to take a picture of the bear <laughs> and there he was and he got a picture, but it's very blurry because he was running. So not something I would advise any anybody to do. Uh, I'm trying to think from our last one, we went February. I think uh, we did a live just before I went to Harrisburg and uh, the Harrisburg show, the Pennsylvania uh, RV Super Show was a huge success. They uh, had record attendance at over 650 RVs there, which was amazing because of all the, um, you know, the forums and all the uh, rumors that you hear about uh, short supply at dealerships and so forth. They had them there and it was great. We did seminars all weekend long and uh, had really good attendance. And, and uh, if anybody's out there that was at the show, I really appreciate you coming out. And, uh, and thanks for joining us. So we got some questions that have already come in and we're going to start off. We'll go to the top here and wow, we got a lot of questions. Colleen For Forrester, I believe, what would cause the freshwater tank to fill up on a 97 Nash 22 G? Um, this is a, a common question. It's kind of odd. I've gotten it about five or six times here in the last three or four weeks that somebody's to the city waterfall fill and their freshwater tank fills up and uh, typically what will cause it on a, on a 97 Nash I'm not sure if you have a switch over valve a lot of RVs will have where you hook up to your city water fill and then you have gravity feed for your freshwater tank but some of them will have a valve that allows you to switch and that'll divert the water pressure from your city water fill to your tank so you don't have to take it off physically and fill that in. And I've, we had that happen on one of the RVs we've been working on with videos, the Brave that uh, you probably have seen several times. We actually did a video on replacing that valve. Uh, the other thing it could be if, if you don't have that valve, then uh, you have a pressure, uh, a back pressure valve or a check valve in your water, uh, your, your fresh water pump. And uh, whether you've got a sure flow or a flow jet or there's even a new aqua something in there, but um, you know, on the the side that draws water from the tank itself, it'll have a check valve. And if you have that city water fill fill, you know, going, and that check valve is getting weak, um, excuse me, and then it will backfeed into your freshwater tank. So what you're going to need to do, um, sometimes you can just run the, the pump several times, put some hot water in the freshwater tank. And run the pump, and it kind of uh, softens the. So I guess that question is from last month. Oh, that question's from last month. Tell them the first question of this month is actually from the unfcpo retired. Ah, okay. And she said that. So anyway, Pauline, if she's looking, and if anybody else wants that, get the check valve. Uh, run your pump just a few times, and sometimes that'll take care of it. Other times. You're going to have to take the pump out and, and rebuild that check valve. Okay, so let's, Dave asks, I keep saying, Tom, Tom, Bill, Carl, Curtis, Theodore, Doug, Patrick. There we go. Uh, USNCPO retired. And I'm assuming that it um, stands for U.S. Navy Corps. And it, uh, if it does, I appreciate your service. My grandfather was in the... Navy reserves in World War II served on the Bosque, and I have his ship sitting up in my, not his ship, a picture of his ship. I don't have the ship. So anyway, um, he asked, I have a 2010 Itasca Eclipse, a Winnebago product, and the last year, all of the windows that open have been clouding up with moisture. What are my options? Can I fix this or I have to replace them? 
So what you have is you've got dual pane windows in there and there's an air gap in between it. That's not argon filled or any type of gas filled like, uh, you know, residential stuff was just because of the twisting and, and stress you can get on those windows. Um, and there's a gasket all the way around that outside of it. And eventually what happens is that gasket with the twisting that you get, and even with a big unit like an eclipse uh, or ellipse, um, you are, you're going to get some twisting in that and you're going to get temperature changes. So a lot of times those gaskets will go, will go bad. And there are some companies that, that they basically got moisture inside and they, and they etch. And there are some companies that I have seen that you can uh, go to and they will take those out and they'll reglaze that whole thing. And, and um, it's a lot cheaper than replacing the windows, but it is not a do it yourself job to take that window apart. Um, you've got you know, some trim. We've, we've, we, we haven't done it uh, other than we've taken a window out of a travel trailer and showed that process of it. But uh, you'll see where there's riveted um, connectors in there and the pieces in it. So it's, it's a pretty challenging job to do it. If you want to take um, a stab at it yourself, one of the things I guess I would recommend is to call the Winnebago Owner Relations Department. They have um, outstanding people in there and the guy that runs it is uh, you know, a relative of mine and I call him, he's a go-to guy with anything Winnebago and if, if anybody has done the procedure, he would have done it and, and may have a, a couple little tips on, on doing that, but it's, uh, I don't think there's any documentation. I do know I've seen some YouTube videos uh, out in the, in the internet um, on some that are similar to that. Winnebago, most of the time, I think in 2010, uh, were making their own windows. And so they would have kind of a proprietary style to that. Um, but you should, if you want to replace them, look at Herd or Hair, H-E-H-R, and Herd is H-U-R-D. Um, you might be able to find some there. And then just, you know, compare what's the price of, uh, you know, uh, buying those and replacing them versus if you want to tackle it yourself. Um, we'll see if we can't find that company that uh, uh, reconditions them, but you know, then, then you're kind of, you know, it's hit and miss what part of the country they're in and what part of the country you're in. So not a real good choice in that one. Sheila says, 1989 Jayco, 32 foot, the door hinge is so worn, the door doesn't close well unless I pull to move the door upward. Is there a fix or something like this? I cannot find a new piano type hinge that will work. Um, 1989, I'm not exactly familiar with it, but if you say it's a piano hinge, I'm assuming it's a continuous full length hinge, uh, in there. And I would, I would venture to say you probably would be able to find something like that at a home improvement store. That's a fairly, uh, generic type of, of a hinge. The other thing that, um, you might want to look at is there are several, um, junkyards, RV junkyards, salvage yards, I guess you'd want to call them instead that might have uh, some product like this. And, and then the other thing I would, I would suggest is uh, contact Lippert. And uh, Lippert makes a whole line of doors and hinges and you might be able to find something that'll retrofit. You might have to get a new door. Um, you know, I, I doubt that, but I'm pretty sure you should be able to find, uh, if it's a standard piano hinge, which I'm thinking the 89 Jayco had, that was a pretty basic unit. Um, you know, the, the Winnebago's were using a three hinge system that was, you know, designed a little differently. And that's, that's a little harder to come by. So try, try those outlets. Uh, VTD 48 says just bought a 2019 forest river gray wolf travel trailer. Also bought a NOCO genius five by two charger with connections that bolt onto the two 12 volt deep cycle batteries. Is it okay to leave the charger cable attached? Hold on here. To the batteries and simply power up the charger when the batteries are um, need charging. Will the constant hookup to the charger damage the charger or drain the batteries? I was considering changing the alligator clips. Thanks. Uh, you can leave them. Um, you can leave them actually connected to it because. Uh, I don't know of any chargers that are are actually, or even the batteries um, that that are con drawing back. You know, so you've got your charger, 
and this is what a lot of people will do this, um, you know, when they put their units in storage, just to be able to maintain those batteries, they'll plug the unit in, they leave that charger continuously on, um, that, that's a, a converter in their rig, uh, similar to something like this. This is actually the converter over on this side, which is a charger. And when the batteries drop down to 50%, somewhere around the 12 volt range, uh, it will kick on at, at 13.6 volts until the batteries reach 12.6 and then it drops to 13.2. And so if you've got, I'm assuming the NOCO, and I'm not, I'm not familiar with that, um, but I'll look it up, Genius 5 by 2 so I'm, I'm assuming that's a portable generator that, or charger, but that wouldn't be any different than this. The only thing I would be careful of is just to make sure it doesn't do a real high charge and stay on it. You want it to stay right at about 13.2, just to, just to keep those batteries topped off all the time when you're not, when you're not using it. Okay. Mike Rogers has a 2022 reflection 337 RLS. I'm snowbirding here in Florida, and I am so jealous that he actually snowed this morning again, sideways, but we're in Iowa. Um, since January 1st, when I got here, I turned my electric water on, and this week the DSI fault light came on twice. What could make that happen? So the DSI fault light is direct spark ignition, and so if you're running it on the electric side, that should have nothing to do with your direct, your direct spark, your DSI fault light. Um, you know, and I guess you know the question I have first of all is if you're running it on electric, then uh, did you start it up with water in the tank? Because if you didn't, it will burn that system out. But then it wouldn't be working at all. So you know, it wouldn't be a matter of just the light coming on. You would have no hot water. Have you tried it on electric? and on propane um you know and you can actually run both at the same time in, in most of the models there's a switch that you hook put on for the electric side of it and then you can also start up the propane side and you can get twice as fast of, of water heating but try turning off the electric and seeing if the um, propane side works of it and other than that i don't I, I don't know why the dsi fault light would come on and when you're using it on the electric side so i you know a couple questions of how you're using it and what you're seeing would help to provide a little more specific answer on that terry says how long do you keep a camper plugged in when covered up in the winter uh, do we have to remove batteries in the winter if it is plugged in you use an inverter on when not connected to shore power correct Thank you very much. Okay, so there's a couple different nuances in this. And if you have electrical power available, then it, you know, you want to keep it plugged in all the time as long as you have a converter that does the multi-stage, like I said, 13.2 goes down to 12 or 13.6 goes down to 13.2 as kind of a maintenance one. You won't lose a lot of battery power when you're stored, but um, it, it, you'll naturally lose some anyway. And you're probably looking at, uh, you know, a battery could go dead in about three to four weeks. Uh, if you have nothing connected to it, it'll go down faster. If you've got the LP leak detector, that's usually wired directly to the battery. Even though you have a um, disconnect switch in that unit, um, unless you pull the, the negative post cable off, um, that LP leak detector will still draw from uh, that battery and so that'll go a little faster but then you know if you have it plugged in your converter is going to charge it up to at, at 13.6 unless you have a winnebago that'll do 13.8 um, some of the multi-stage chargers will get up into 14 to 16 but the big thing is is just to make sure that goes back down into a maintained stage which is your 13.2 so uh, i would i would say look at what kind of converter you have and um, you know, let us know, and then we can look up the specs on it and see. But if it's a WIFCO, WFCO, um, it's going to do 13.6. If it's a Magnatech like Winnebago, it'll do 13.8. Um, if you have an inverter, now you brought that up too, that the inverter is only used when you're dry camping. And uh, that's not always true. Um, 
there's a variety of different scenarios. For example, um, if you have a residential refrigerator, that that'll go through the. Or let me let me step back a second. If you have outlets inside, uh, that inverter on like the Winnebago is connected to three outlets inside. So even if you're plugged in, it's going to help charge the battery, and that inverter is going to power those three outlets. So it's designed for dry camping use, but it's still going to be used when you're camping and plugged in, um, th you know, through that conversion in the inverter. Now, if you have a large inverter that is also a charger, you know, you get into um, usually 2000 watts. There are a couple out there that are 1000 watts, but they also charge the battery and they will do a multi-stage charge. So, you know, there's different scenarios, but I would say you're, you're okay to leave it uh, connected the whole time that you're, you're running or that you're storing the unit. Um, so, and I was just, um, I don't see it here. If Katie has, uh, what's our download for today? Um, maybe if you could post that for me and, and I can let the people know on here. So Terry, we did that. Um, Danny asks, I am not connected to city water fill when using my holding tank and the pressure pump. I have water leaking out the city water connection point. Oh, okay. So Danny was the one that was talking beforehand. If you have water leaking out your city water connection, you're not hooked up, then what you have is in your city water, there is a check valve in there and that has gone bad. That is designed to hold the pressure from shooting out that city water connection in there. If you, if you look in there, take that cap off, you'll see this little plunger, spring-loaded plunger that's supposed to be a one-way check valve in that. So that has gotten weak or it's gotten calcium, something in there that uh, keeps it from, from shutting and uh, should be able to replace that. Uh, and the USNCO retired says, thanks for the answers. It helps. I full-time so I can go anywhere in the country. I will look them up. CPO stands for Chief Petty Officer. Okay, that's... I knew, I knew, I was pretty sure, but I didn't want to get it correct. I did, USN, I knew that. So again, thank you. And I uh, actually have my grandfather's duty case. That's not even what it's called. Um, out on display at the local VFW with the stars and stripes and the pack of Chesterfields with no filters and no tax stamp. So anyway, he'll know what that means. Joe says, hi, I re uh, recently purchased a 2004 Newell 45 foot eight inch coach and uh, the riding height of the chassis appears low at the rear side, low chassis distance to the ground, approximately eight inches, suspecting some issue with air leaks. Would you recommend methods and tools that are useful for troubleshooting and detect the lo location of the airline? Um, well, the first thing I guess I would I would do is um, see if you can get a hold of Newell, and uh, I'm not even sure who owns them anymore. If they're uh, their own entity, but you know, with the last two or three years in the in the industry, it's been quite a quite a circus. Um, and and just get what the specs are. Um, I would suspect that if you've got one lower, you know, how much lower is the and you say the chassis appears low at the rear side, low chassis distance ground. So is it both both back wheels or is it one wheel? Um, and if it is, is eight inches, then the other thing that I would recommend is, um, you know, just get the coach to a point where the, the chassis, the air suspension is pumped up to what it says. You know, the buzzer's not beeping, anything's going on. You, you've got the, you don't have the dump off of it or anything and then uh just take and and you should be able to find those airbags um i don't remember what kind newell used back in, in those days i think it was very similar to um i think they had their own proprietary chassis i don't think they were using freightliner or spartan but you should be able to see the airbags um you either have one great big airbag right at the inside of the wheel or you've got two front and back of of the axle smaller ones um, you know, that's what Freightliner did with theirs. Monaco used the one big, huge bag and you should be able to get in there and just, you know, hit it with some soapy water and see if you can find a leak. Um, my guess would be if you just recently purchased and it sat for a long time, 
a lot of times what happens is that when air leaks out of those bags, uh, for whatever reason, a very small leak or they sit long enough, the bags get uh, pancaked and they, uh, they get kind of weather checked or, or torn uh, just enough to, to make a leak on it. So I would say that you should get hit those bags pretty hard uh, with a soapy water solution. And you should be able to follow the line from the bag to a point. Um, you know, again, maybe Newell has uh, wiring diagrams on those that'll show where it's at. Um, that old a coach, I'd, I'd say you're going to have a challenge doing it. So you might need to find a dealership that specializes in Newell. And, and that would be a good thing to post on one of our social medias. One, too. we have five or six technicians out there that uh, have some really good resources that, you know, and I, and I can do it too, um, to see if we can find somebody that's familiar with that Newell or has a diagram or has worked on them. Some of that older stuff, you know, the documentation is, is really bad. Um, Winnebago is outstanding. You go on their website and you can see um, 3D drawings and parts lists and wiring diagrams and plumbing diagrams. I wish everybody would do that. Don says, I am working on my 2015 Avenger, Avenger replacing the seals on my slide. The original seals are not available. I'm looking at the one-piece seal with steel rubber products, which is the D seal attached to the flat seal. Um, I want to use it in the interior seal next year. Do you have any concerns or suggestions? Um, the first thing I, I would I would look at uh, ah, RPT Trimlock. Okay, that's who it is. Trimlock is uh, one of the premier um, bulb seal and seal companies out in the market, and I would say they've got exactly what you're looking for in in that seal. And when you say a D seal attached to the flat seal, um, I'm assuming that it it looks like. Um, probably either the flange as the room goes in um, on the inside of it or on the wall portion itself. And that should be a fairly common uh, product to get. I don't, I don't think you should have any problems with it. Where you start running into issues, if they did a proprietary seal, um, you know, that had a, we call it a squeegee uh, that went on the side of it. Sometimes that's a little harder to find. But um, anyway, <coughs> excuse me. I, I would say that uh, I would get a hold of trim lock and, and do it. So interior seal and exterior seal. Okay. So, yeah, no, I, I don't see any problems with that. Um, you know, it will help seal up that, that coach. So you're had that but he added something he would you recommend that the tools and detect the location of the airline the coach has a steerable tag wheel and valid true line auto leveling system okay i'm not familiar with that but again it's newell was a you know a fairly um i don't want to say obscure but kind of a um you know a real highline product and there wasn't a lot of information not available that kind of protected their dealer so i i would recommend getting in and hitting those bags with the Soapy water. Don says the old seal configuration connected the inner seal to the out outer seal, forming a channel that trapped water and rotted the beam above the slide opening. I don't want to have that happen again. I am replacing the beam at the same time. So that was Don up there with the, yep, 2015 Avenger. So again, trim lock would be a good one to get into and a good idea to replace it if it was catching that stuff. So one other thing, the old seal configured to connect the inner seal to the outer seal, forming a channel that trapped water and rotted the beam above the slide opening. So one of the things you might also want to add to that, if it was creating that, and I'm, I'm trying to visualize this in my mind where it's exactly at, but I think I've got a pretty good idea. Um, you might want to add a slide room topper. Uh, I would bet that your, your unit does not have that. Um, you know, those are great for diverting water away from some of those critical areas like that. 
um, you know, that, that as long as you've got the drip cap that comes up, first of all, that diverts it on the very top, but then that, that awning cover, and they're easy to put on. Uh, there's a video on online. We'll put one on a, probably a 14-foot um, toy hauler Raptor, and it's not very expensive. Okay, so Katie said, uh, grab the download, How to Keep Mice Out of Your RV. Um, it is posted on our question page here. It is at um, go.rvclub.com backslash A15156. So you should be able to see that on your um, on the website here. Danny says, Danny again with his 22 Jayco is pre-wired in the storage area for an inverter. The label marked high voltage. Do you know if, if how, if it is already appropriately wired to the 120 volt breaker panel, do I have to choose what I power up? So <clears throat> right, let me walk through this a little bit. It says, it says it's pre-wired in the storage area for an inverter. Label marked high voltage. Do you know, is it already appropriately wired to 120 volt breaker panel? So I'm assuming it is, it is, um, you've got basically Romex running from the distribution panel back to there. So your wire is already in there, ready to go. You don't have to try to fish it in through different stuff. I would, I would imagine it's just a blank wire, not hooked up to anything at the distribution panel, not hooked up to anything there because there are, there are a variety of different inverters available. And the one that, that uh, like this one here uh, is a go power. And we pretty much have plus and minus on the back side that comes in to positive and negative that, that comes into here. And then um, this model does not have a, a hard wire or an in and out. So you would put those two to here. This one, you physically wire this in. And what it will do is when you have uh, hard wire or electrical available, it will sense that and it will not draw from the batteries. Okay, I'm sorry. You have, you have this one is the basic one where you have positive and negative coming from your 12 volt source. And I got confused because I just did one of these a couple days ago that was different than that. And it was a, um, I believe a Freedom. Freedom X is exactly what it was. And that one, you have 110 coming in and 110 going out. So it's a pass through. This one is just a straight draw from the battery. So you have positive and negative battery cables coming in here. You have a ground on this side of it. Then you plug something into it. So, um, you know, this, this one would not be something that your pre-wire would even work with because you want something that back here will have 110 in, 110 out, and then it'll also have 12 volt. What? Okay, getting direct directions. Quiet on the set. So um, I would I would say probably, Danny, what you what I would recommend is to first of all look at what kind of inverter you're going to put in there. Um, you know, I do like the Go Power stuff. They have bigger ones than this what you want to power you know that's that's the whole thing and what we were looking at is uh what we could use if we put in a residential or a 12 volt um compressor driven refrigerator like the ever chill or the dometic in into a unit and we needed power from the battery we'd have to have an inverter that would do it so we would need something that would have to do about a thousand watts um you know, and they've got anything else that you're going to power, you know, you have to go 1500, even more than that. And, um, you know, so that is something that we would look at. First of all, what size inverter would you go to? Then you want to find one that has the 110 in, 110 out. And, uh, and then it, it has a 12 volt cables that go to the battery. So that is kind of what I'm thinking your pre-wire in the storage area is for. And it may even be that you have um, 
you know, battery cable that is in there as well. So let's look at what you got for an, what you're looking to get for an inverter, and then I'll do a little bit more research when they say pre-wire in the storage area for an inverter. Is that do they have 110 going in there, or do they have just a 12 volt cable that like this one would have? So you got a couple different options. Joe says no sound. I think we fixed that. <laughs> that was from a little while ago. Okay, we, we had a battery issue. I thought I put new batteries in both of these, but I did not. And it might be that I had that one on because we set up for Tuesday and then we lost internet connection at the main office back at the host. So we're, we're back on. It wouldn't be fun if we didn't have technical issues. Charles says he's got a 2017 Heartland Bighorn. When I set my water valve to city, my fresh water tank overfills and water comes out the overflow valve. So here we have the another one, just like we, we talked about up in the earlier ones. Um, so you've got a valve in yours and what the way it, this, it's supposed to work is that when you're hooked to the city water fill, you have pressurized water that goes bypasses the pump and goes to all your faucets, your shower and everything in there. And there's an inline valve then that if you want to fill up your city water tank, excuse me, your fresh water tank, without having to disconnect and put it into the gravity fill. And in Winnebago even, when they first came out with that option, they didn't even put a gravity fill in. So you got into a remote location that didn't have, you know, that a connector just had a spring-loaded uh, hose that they cut off the end of it. You couldn't fill your water tank, so they, they changed that. But... The valve, then when you switch that, will divert the water to the freshwater tank and it will fill the tank. And so one of two things, first of all, I would look at that valve and, it, you know, it's probably not shutting off. And we did, a, we did a video, replaced one on a 2003 Winnebago Brave. Uh, that one was kind of a challenge because it was hidden behind all this metal uh, service center stuff that we we had a real tough time getting it out um you know so that's the first thing i would look at and you if you have access to get back behind there and see some of that um you know that piping that plumbing that's in there um it'd be a little easier to get to the other thing that could possibly be is is your water pump and we just talked about this a little bit beforehand and i think i took my pump to this shoot area but i don't have it here but on the incoming side of your water pump you have a check valve so that when you get pressurized water it's not it's going to come back through that system but it's supposed to hold it from going through that uh fresh water pump and if that gets weak and it allows water to go back through it's going to go into your fr your fresh water tank because that's where it's drawing from and then it will fill up that tank so those are the two areas that I, I would look at. So it's got to be one of those two that's that's doing that. Now, um, it, when I mentioned before that, one of the things that you might be able to do before digging into all this other stuff is I have had times where I run the water pump with some hot water in the fresh water tank, drain everything else out, disconnect the city water fill, run that run hot water into the uh, fresh water tank, and then run the uh, pump and cycle it, you know, for maybe let it run for about uh, five minutes or so, not quite that, a couple minutes, hot, turn it off, let the, the pump back up, turn it on again, you know, do that four or five times. Um, sometimes that'll flush it out. It could just be calcium or, or lime that, that has gotten into that check valve. Um, the other thing that it can also do is just soften some of those uh, rubber grommets that are, are in, in that, or rubber seals, I guess, more uh, descriptive in that. And, and you might get by with doing that and, and stopping it. So take a look at SureFlow has a real good diagram. It'll show you where that, uh, that check valve is at. It's right on the front of the, uh, of the motor itself. Um, Bighorn. Daniel says, I have a fire under the hood of my 1983 Chevy Tioga. Who in my area of Sheboygan, Wisconsin, can help me get the wiring and other problems taken care of? That I do not know. Um, I'm not familiar with Sheboygan. Um, that, uh, but the '83 Chevy Tioga is going to be a challenge 
uh, to do that. So what, I guess the one of the things I would do is post that on the Facebook page, see if uh, anybody else out there has got wiring diagrams. And again, that is something Fleetwood was very, very bad at documentation. However, that, that Tioga, it's got a, a Chevy, and I'm assuming that it's either E350 or 450, 83. It's probably a 350. That you know was a fairly common band style front end. So you should um, have, a, have a little more luck trying to find some of that wiring diagrams and, and so forth. Now that 83, that, that uh, Chevy van was used in delivery vans and all kinds of stuff. So, you know, you might be able to find a, a Chevy dealer that's been in business for a long period of time that, that uh, would be able to track back to some of this, this stuff and, and, uh, and see it, um, or, you know, or, or be able to help you with that. So that, that would be my recommendation. Scott says 2350 KRK, no heat from the bedroom register. Well, I need to remove the belly panel or look near the furnace. So um, the, I would suggest, and, and there's, there's two different schools of thought on furnaces and, and how, they're, um, how they deliver the heat, the airflow to it. And both of them start with a forced air furnace. So you get either Suburban or uh, Atwood or Hydroflame. There's a variety of them out there, but they kind of all work the same. They, they've got a cold air return that comes in and um, it, go, it goes over the burner assembly and then it comes out and it either goes into a plenum that is distributed under the flooring section to your vents or more likely, I think in your case, you probably have what we call the elephant trunks. They are just the corrugated, um, shiny gray trunks that that weave underneath the uh, cabinets and under the under the sofas and then beds and dinettes and some of those places like that. So, if you're in the bedroom area, I would probably um, I'd venture to say that either that hose is running and it, and it depends on where your vent's at. If your vent's in the bedroom and it's on the pedestal of the bed, you'll have that hose coming right to that vent um, if you can get access underneath the bed. If it's on the floor somewhere, then you're gonna have to access underneath and usually you can see them from a uh, storage compartment or something underneath. And I, I would say that either that hose has gotten kinked and it won't let airflow go through it or that hose is disconnected from the vent. I've seen that happen before. You might be able to take the vent out, just you should have two screws, take the vent out and just kind of see what's down underneath it, and and if uh, there, you know, you can get your hand in there and access the hose, or is it a plenum? If it's a plenum, then you're going to have to backtrack that plenum and figure out, okay, why am I not getting heat there? Then more than likely, what it is is some kind of a diverter at the furnace where it's supposed to come out and and have just little uh, diverter plates that separate the air, and something might have gotten moved. I've seen this more in the in the air conditioning side than I've seen it in the heating side. But, uh, those are the two places I would look at. Pete Christie says he's got 2013 J flight. Um, I have a leak at the toilet where it connects to the valve to the cap, which is clamped to the PEX, Home Depot, Lowe's, Menards, Amazon, one half fitting and the black water does not fit. Where is the best place to find one? So I, I'm not sure what Jayco uses uh, for their plumbing system, but I am pretty sure that uh, it's more than likely a flare system. And even, you know, even though they have PEX hose, um, a lot of those manufacturers will use a, a flare it uh, connector, which is in, in especially, uh, I do not have, I don't have a toilet down here, but I thought I had a flare it system at some point, but I don't, I, no, I have the PEX one. Um, and what flare it is, is it's got a hose barb that pops into the hose and then it's got threads on it and it has a cap that goes in and connects really tight on the cap. That's typically what Dometic and Sealand uh, and some of those use on the toilet side of it. And so I, I would say you're probably um, not going to find anything at the home improvement stores because it's a, it's a totally different 
um, connection system. And I, I would not use the PEX in, in that area. So uh, I would say that if you can find the brand, it's probably a Sealand Traveler, um, or it could be a, a, again, a couple of the other ones that are out there. I, they don't come to mind right now, but find out the brand of the toilet you have and, and go on their website. A lot of those companies you can buy direct from them, um, you know, or you're going to have to go through a dealership, but it's probably a flare it system. David says, I have a 2015 Winnebago trend and recently I'm getting an error code with my ambient sensor where the temperature shows at 160 degrees, even after sitting overnight. Question is, does this create a problem for the engine? Someone mentioned it doesn't create an issue for the vehicle and is still drivable. Do you know what would need replacing? Um, okay, so the trend, you're getting an error code with the ambient sensor where the temperature shows 160 degrees when sitting overnight. So what sensor are we looking at? First of all, um, you know, is, is it the engine? Because you mentioned the engine. This doesn't create a problem for the engine. So I'm assuming that um, we're, we're talking about the engine and your actual gauges um, on the dash. And, you know, keep in mind your, your RV is going to run at about 200 degrees um, with that en engine coolant that is in there. But after it sits overnight, you know, it should be whatever the ambient temperature of the inside of the rig and the outside of the rig are at. So, you know, if you're overnight here in Iowa, you're at 20 degrees right now, but, you know, you're probably in a warmer area in there. So I would say that you, you probably have an issue with that sensor and it's a 2015. So I, it, you might... I'm not sure what the warranty is on that, but I would check. I would call Winnebago, first of all, and their owner relations department, get it documented, what you're seeing. And it's very possible that's something that is a recall notice or um, an issue that they've had before. And they, you know, they might send you the sensor or they might give you the issue with it. I don't think 160 degrees is going to do any damage, but I also don't believe 160 degrees is that temperature. Because if you leave it sit overnight, and you take a temperature gauge inside and it's, you know, put it inside the engine compartment and it should read the same as what's outside. That should have cooled down to that point. So there should be nothing in there that is, you know, creating any type of a heat source that would keep that at 120 degrees. So, um, again, I would, I would call and, uh, and, and find out. I would just, I would venture to say it's a weak sensor. Uh, should have mentioned in engine temperature. Okay, that was the very next one. Staying in the line with the, the middle. Okay, so yeah, I, again, I, I would think that it's definitely something in that gauge. I wouldn't be too worried about it, but I would call and document it just to just to make sure. Uh, Terry said, I had to step away briefly. May have missed a question someone posted earlier, but if not, do you have to use antifreeze for winterization or can you just use air compressor? So, uh, yeah, Terry, you, the, the two methods are, one is to fill all the lines and everything with RV antifreeze. Um, and the other me method is to just get rid of all the water in your RV so it won't freeze and it won't bust the pipes or the water heater or anything like that. So the way you use the air, um, I just built this little deal here. And do I have my, yes, I do. This one you can see it blew out because I, Try to blow out a line in a house at 110 degree, 110 psi, and my air compressor, and this wouldn't hold it. So I built another one that is in my little bag of goodies right here. And what this is. First of all, you drain the water out of your fresh water tanks. You drain the water out of the water heater. You put on the bypass on the water heater. And then this is just a hose clamp I got at Harbor Freight um, and an air chuck, piece of garden hose with the male end on it here. If you don't want to 
cut up a good garden hose, you can just buy a, a half inch tubing at Ace Hardware or Home Depot, something like that, and then, then put one of those garden fitting hoses on it and a clamp on that side as well. I hook this up to my city water fill. I hook this up to my air compressor. I dial it down to 40 PSI unless I'm forgetful and leave it at 110 like I did this last one. So I don't want to blow out my RV stuff in there. And then uh, turn the compressor on and then just go inside and open up your um, farthest faucet till air comes out. Then open up next closest, your toilet, your the, the shower handle for the toilet, the shower itself, exterior. Um, the, the only other thing you have to, then you're going to have to run the water pump to get the rest of the water from the lines because this is going to bypass that pump. So you got to get out of the pump and the before and after lines. And then if you have a um, ice maker in your refrigerator, you're going to want to cycle that through a couple times because th this won't um, push all that air out of there un unless the actual um, ice maker cycles. So it's going to have to open up that valve, get rid of the rest of the water that, that's up in there. And they have a, pr a procedure in the owner's manual that shows, you know, just get all the water out, take your, your um, under sink filter out of it. It's got a bypass plug that you can put in there. And then as you cycle that, it'll run water in and blow some air out of it and, and get everything in. So that's the way I typically like to do it. The only problem is, is if you're going to be traveling in and out of cold weather, like mountains and, and you know, down south and stuff like that, you have to have an air compressor with you to do that where, um, you know, those, those guys typically would just carry some jugs of, of antifreeze and then they winterize and then dewinterize. So different thoughts, Ford versus Chevy, I guess, right? So, hi, Dave, could you suggest a product for securing rubber seals on either side of the slides? Uh, these are not the seals that scrape the sides, but they are compressed by, yep, the, the D seals. I think, isn't that Jeff? Was that Somebody else was talking about the exact same thing. Um, so, I mean, there's there's some products. Normally, what I what I recommend is just get a hold of Trimlock and get the rubber seals. The D, it's called a D seal, so it's got a flat side on one side and then the round, and so it's shaped like a D, and it already has the adhesive that is um, on that. And that's you know that is some of the best product that that I have seen to, to stick on and to stay on. Um, you know, I know, I know some people that have, have tried uh, carpet tape. Um, that's usually really, uh, you know, it's got a very, very strong adhesive used uh, to that. Um, you know, even even Gorilla Glue uh, is something that uh, I have seen on, on a lot of those. But, you know, typically I haven't, I haven't had to glue much of the seams on. They've come with their own pull off, um, you know, little piece of paper and adhesive to, to go on there. So, uh, but those are some options. I, I think that you'd be fine just using either, either one of those. And I think with that, it looks like silicone is, these are not the slides that scrape the sides, but they are compressed, but someone is closed. It looks like a silicone is still the only thing holding it at the top, but it looks like whatever was used along the edge has failed. So I, I would, um, I, I guess I didn't see this last sentence. It looks like a silicone is still the only thing holding it on the top, but it looks like whatever was used along the side has failed. And probably, I, I don't think they used silicone um, to actually um, adhere the seals to the side, but they probably put a bead of silicone up on the top of it to try to keep moisture from coming in and working its way um, underneath that seal if it was up against the sidewall in it. So I, I wouldn't recommend silicone um, in that application. I would re recommend more of an adhesive. The Gorilla Glue seems to be, you know, something that's phenomenal for everything, but you got to find something that is compatible with the painted metal that you're probably putting it on or fiberglass and rubber on the other side. And that's, that's kind of where I, I, I tend to go back towards either the seal that has the adhesive on it, or maybe even like a carpet tape that would have some, you know, pretty heavy, heavy adhesive to it. Um, 
so that is the last of the questions we have. And we got a couple minutes here. Oh, no, here's some more. Is it? No. Nope, that's the last one. So that gives me a, a chance to demonstrate our latest little product that came in. And um, we had, I do seminars at shows around the country, and one of the seminars is, is traveling with pets. Um, we have one that we, uh, things to know, uh, cool tools and so forth. So one of the topics that we get into is how do you test the water source at a campground? Um, I've had several people I've talked to that have gone into campgrounds. And even I had this at one point when we were camping quite a few years ago, um, my dog that we took with us would not drink the water. We put some water in the bowl from the campground source and she came over and it was just like, nope, nope, nope. And I didn't think too much of it. I thought she's just picky. She wants toilet water because that's what she drinks at home all the time, it seems like. And so um, I was in the campground store at the office and, uh, you know, I was made some kind of a comment about how my, my dog must be picky, doesn't like your water. And they said, you know, we had somebody else that commented about how their, um, their dog had uh, thrown up. And so they tested the water and found out that there was high levels of E. coli or some, I don't, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it, uh, it really made me think about how, how sanitary is the water in a campground service uh, or source. And so I did some research on that and campgrounds have to test their water and certify it once a year. They put up an MSDS sheet on it and, uh, but things can happen in between that. So what I do is when I travel down the road, um, on the road, I take with me, this is going to be, I should have gotten this out before, but I didn't know we'd run out of time and get to this. I take an LP leak detector. There we go. So this, this is the first stage, and this is called an IntelliTech digital water purity sensor. And all it is, is it's, it's two probes in here, and it will tell you the levels, the acceptable levels of bacteria um, or particles per million that are in here, not bacteria. It, the idea is that, you know, the more contaminated water is, the less connectivity it will have in here. So when you see those numbers skyrocket in there, you know there's something in there. It's something wrong. And it doesn't identify exactly what it is, but it's a great source to start off and say, this is an acceptable you know, water source that I, I can use. Um, after that, then there's a product called Safe Home that you can get at most of your home improvement stores that will literally go in and tell you the acidity, the pH value, the minerals. Um, you know, There's bacteria tests you can get, that kind of stuff. So if you're going to be doing some, um, you know, out to some places where you might have some some challenging water. Clear Source was a product I ran across that is one of the most fantastic water purification systems that I have seen. Uh, I got the the other model here. This is the Nomad, and uh, turn it around here. This is a product that if you're going to be doing a lot of dry camping and or even tent camping or something like that, or you're gonna try and pull from a river source or something, it has an onboard water pump where, you know, if, if you're just concerned about the water coming from the faucet at the campground, you would use the clear source other uh, product here. But this one has its own pump, so you can literally get it from the river or a lake or whatever and draw that in. And then it's got a series of uh, filters in, you know, the, the key in filtering water is the microns down to the filtration system that you can get in these things. And these will do like 99.9% um, purity, sanitizing. They'll get rid of viruses and everything. So it's a pretty cool system. Um, it, this one does work off of a 12-volt and where is my source? Right there is my plug-in. So I would have to uh, 
the, and the plug-in comes with it in the box. I would have to hook it up to a battery source, um, you know, at some point. But it, it is kind of a, a, a cool product to take a look at. And, and uh, if you're really looking at doing some serious water filtration and purification, Clear Source is the company that does that. Let me see where we're at here. And Jeff says Gorilla Glue or Carpet Tape. And that's uh, that's what I would do. So with that, we're right at 5 o'clock now. And I appreciate everybody coming back or coming and joining us today. And uh, we're starting to see some good weather. So campgrounds are going to start filling up. And we're going to be able to get out and, and enjoy the, the summertime. Get your reservations early because there's a lot of new campers that are hitting the ground. So with that, I appreciate your coming out. Have a great rest of the week and the weekend. Follow your favorite your basketball teams if you're if you're in the NIT or NCAA. I'm an Iowa fan, so we we normally don't get to watch much basketball in March. So, with that, I appreciate you coming out. Have a great night. Thank you. Yeah, da, 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 da.